I'm Ben Peterson. I'm the Community and Collaborative Design Director here at the BSA. And I'm very excited that we have a wonderful cohort of designers who have elected to participate in this first round of projects. I'm excited to introduce them today. Um, I recognize also that we have a handful of our community partners, both potential or prospective. Um, welcome to each of you. Um, this session is being recorded, so we'll be able to upload it to the web later if you want to share it with any of your colleagues or pass it around with anyone that you think might be interested in this work. Um, I am going to give a brief overview, just a reminder of some of the program's broader ambitions, and then turn it right over to our wonderful design teams. We have eight design teams here. We're going to present their work in a very rapid fire, uh, a chakucha style presentation. Um, if you do have questions, concerns, comments as we're moving through the presentations, feel free to put them in the chat. And I'd also ask um, our design teams and design partners to share any contact information as we move forward in case any of you feel like following up after this session. I'm going to share my screen quickly now. Um, hopefully, you can all see this. I'm getting some nods. Great. Um, just a quick overview. So, uh, the program in community and collaborative design here at the BSA is not new, it's a new iteration. It's emerged out of uh, the legacy of the Community Design Resource Center here at the BSA and really supports our three strategic impact areas in advancing architecture, equity, and the environment. Uh, within the program itself, the, the main ambitions are number one, develop opportunities for you all to connect, to connect design partners with community partners and to expand access to these design resources to organizations that may otherwise not have access. So thanks for being here, it's an important part. We also hope that these projects and the way that we talk about them uh, work to demystify the way designers work and engage broader public audiences as partners and collaborators in this work. We hope that we can explore collaborative models of design practice and in doing so really push on the expanded scope of design services and what we do as architects and spatial designers. And then finally, all of you are here today, you have an interest in this work. Um, it's really the, the seedlings of building broader coalitions in the pursuit of uh, equity, justice, and social and ecological resilience. So thanks again. Um, I'm going to get moving very quickly here because we have a lot to cover, but our design teams are all present except for one, but we have a wonderful video to share. Um, I'll leave this here for now. We're going to start with Architectural Resources Cambridge, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that ARC can share their screen and introduce themselves. I can share all of you. So feel free to take it away. Hello, I'm um, so excited to be here. I, I'm Victor Agron with Architectural Resources Cambridge, or um, more commonly known as ARC. And I'm joined by Shreya Shah and Rebecca Ray, who um, Rebecca will be speaking about one of the projects at the sort of tail end of this quick presentation. And um, we're thrilled to be here. We are a 50 person office. We've been in practice um, for a little over 50 years. And we do mostly educational institutional work with the foundation of spaces for wellness, education, and athletics. And overall, we see our work as creating places for people to learn and grow. Our core value is collective creation. And we believe a diversity of thought and enterprise leads to an engaged conversation and better results. So ultimately, very what we like to do is really connect with people in our in our process and develop a really collaborative process of design where we're working together, hearing every voice and exchanging ideas in a very free way. And through that process, we develop better ideas and better work. 
and fundamentally this engaged conversation leads to better solutions. And emblematic of that work and that process is our work at the Eagle Hill School in Hardwick, Massachusetts. And this is, we're looking at a, a STEM center for them that we completed a little over a, a year ago. And a core part of that process was not only a really integrative, collaborative design work, but also really working to reflect the school's pedagogy in the in the building. And the Eagle Hill School educates um, students with learning challenges. And their core value is that difference is the norm. And when we were designing this building, we really took that as the kind of mantle for our design and really worked to find a way to design spaces where every kid could find a place for themselves and find a place to live and learn and be in, in ways that were personal to them and comfortable for them. And the overall program of the building is a makerspace, new sort of library where we reconceptualize an idea of a library into more of a kind of learning commons where the library is spread throughout the building and that learning and connections between students and people could kind of happen along the way. So really the, the building as a whole is a kind of laboratory for work and learning. And that as students move through the building, which was designed along the campus desire lines, as um, we basically put the building right through the desire lines of the campus. So that the students as they're moving from one place to another would come into the building, connect with their friends and accidental and sometimes improbable ways, find places for pause to learn, grab a book, start a maker project, and find themselves engaged in conversation. The next image is emblematic of, of how that resolved. On the left is a conceptual image of the math core with the Mobius strip. And what we we're trying to do was create an interactive uh, element in the building that the students could engage with that was also a core math principle that evolved into a uh, student led collaboration with an artist in residence where they were actually building this Mobius for the math core. So in that sense, the math, the math concept becomes something real and physical that the students designed and built together with the artist and then become something real in the space. And to the right is the, the main entry of the um, of Eagle Hill School STEM Center, which is the makerspace, the learning commons, the social stair, and all of these things come into come into play right in this one place where students can hang out and do all these different things. Next up is a project that we've been working on with Arlington Eats. And this is smaller, this is um, a space within a newly constructed affordable housing building and it's set to open this fall. And prior to the pandemic, Eats served more than 1800 Arlington residents who faced food insecurity. And with the pandemic, their demand and service more than tripled. So as a result of this project that we've done with them, all of their operations will be in one location for the first time in their 30 year history, which will dramatically increase their efficiency, their ability to serve people. And the space design will also facilitate a new kind of conceptual operational approach with a market like space for distributing food, which then I think also kind of takes the stigma away from from the idea of a food line. It's um, it's much more normative in that sense. And it will give people a flexible lobby to wait inside and connect with people in the, in the way in which people can, can conventionally do in markets. And so the, the space will also allow room for community-based events and services. Um, now I'll turn it over to Rebecca, who will quickly talk about the Cotting School. Yeah, so this is one of those really great projects where we get to feel like our work is invigorating a community. And um, if you don't know, Cotting School serves students with learning and physical challenges. They're based in Lexington. And um, the, the closeness of the school really strikes you when you walk through their doors. It's really apparent. And uh, this was their, this athletic edition is their first new building in 25 years. So it was huge for them. And we really wanted to honor that. And we wanted to make it really special. Um, so here you see an exterior rendering of the new edition. It's, it's being built now, so I don't have 
actual, um, I will spare you all the CA photos, but um, we really worked to bring natural light in and views to nature um, in all the program areas. And we integrated with this existing slope and um, we were happily able to preserve a lot of the mature trees that were on this site. And so the next slide will take you inside. Um, and the program consists of a new gymnasium, arts classrooms, performing and visual, a uh, candle pin bowling alley, and an accessible climbing wall. So for us, this was just this huge opportunity to learn. We got to listen to the client, we got to work with them and really um, stretch their dollars and accommodate their students. The majority of the space is designed um, for quiet and calm. It's um, pretty neutral. Uh, and we wanted to support the student's sensory needs through that. But we also found these great opportunities to kind of strategically bring in color and bring in some energy. So on the top left, um, you see some of our sketches and our uh, models uh, for the candle pin bowling alley, which is interesting. The candle pin bowling, the small ball and the lightweight ball makes it um, really graspable for all of their students. So it's been a great sport for them. So it's kind of an unusual program piece to add in. But um, you can see we really, used color, we blocked out the floor, we delineated the line of play. And then the acoustic uh, ceiling baffles are um, uh, pattern and color for some of their visually impaired or colorblind students. And then this um, multicolored uh, wall mural that you see kind of folding along is really this kind of threefold opportunity to integrate some acoustic dampening um, some color and also student participation. So this idea that they can have some ownership in this space um, from when they move in. And then on the right side, you'll see some images that show our sketches and then a render for this accessible climbing wall. Um, it furthers this theme of getting multiple uses from these components. So this is a pretty massive volume. It uh, is in this double height entry lobby. And we work to make this kind of a sculptural thing and kind of a beautiful thing that serves as an art mural um, be in this kind of grand space beyond its functionality. We spent a lot of time also designing this gate bench that you see in the lower right. So we needed to protect the students from unsupervised wall use, but we wanted to do it in a way that served dual purposes. So we incorporated seating and storage into this kind of very stylized wooden gate. And then um, wrapping up this lower left image shows you a corridor wall. So we really work to balance this necessity of inexpensive sort of off the shelf wall protection. Um, and also this kind of driving desire to keep the space from feeling institutional or like a healthcare facility. And so um, in most areas, the wall protection and the crash rails um, blend in with the color of the adjacent wall. But here we have this kind of mountain pattern um, and this blue flooring strip that sort of elevates this really high traffic area. And they also needed to delineate um, storage space for wheelchairs. So um, these are kind of just some of the things we learned and we really enjoyed about this project. It's turning over in August. So it's gonna be used this, this school year. We're so excited to see the students in this space. It's gonna be great. Excellent. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, ARC. Um, gonna thank move you, Ben. Mike Wilson and uh, Meander Studio. Thank you. Let me just pull this up. The Zoom window is covering my controls. <laughs> um, Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I'm here with Nico Rio Rochero, who, and I'm going to mostly talk for the time moving. Um, and once, once again, I'm going to put my little stock question or something to go over. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you um, because participation and community is really important to everything we do. Meander Studio is a relatively young firm. Um, I come out of an affordable housing background and I started the firm with my former partner as an effort to find ways to collaborate with both community and other designers. So collaboration is part of our name. Um, we've actually just redid our website and with the unusual name of meander.studio, no more.com. Um, so if you wanna find out more information about us, you can also see our website. Uh, 
but I wanted to introduce you to us and the firm. Um, basically, we're only five people. We have an interesting group of people. Um, I have a long history in affordable housing, community participation, and facilitation. So I've done a lot of work with communities to do design reviews, community participation workshops, to get input and find out ways that people can engage. And David Karachi Ube has, you know, he's a Spanish speaker originally from Argentina and was really brought on to help the firm with some visualization and enhance our design skills in terms of being able to tell people what something looks like so they can understand if it feels right. And part of that process for us is testing things. I think one thing as designers we often forget is the skill set to understand what a design will look like and how it will feel in the very end often doesn't happen. So the team is really building out those skills to look at the visualization, to, to look at a community and say, is this this feel right? Is this what your dreams and hopes are and how they can aspire? So David Fight has been working us for a while, has a background um, once upon a time actually inspecting buildings in New York City. So he has a a really fine grained understanding of how things get built. Nico, who's here with me today, um, you know, is from Houston, has traveled extensively to Central America, also a Spanish speaker. Um, and Liana Alexanian um, actually was born in um, Armenia and came here. So we have a, a, a belief in sort of an immigrant process and how our backgrounds and our lives can affect how we work with communities. So here's just some images of us interacting. Um, the upper left slide, um, I did a workshop with members of the Boston School Committee to talk about how to integrate environmental design throughout their systems and get buy-in from the community and how different people and different stakeholders can work and be more environmental. The way we work not only with communities, but contractors and in the building process become critical because oftentimes communities have small budgets and we have to figure out how to make that work to the maximum extent. Um, I've also have a long background in teaching both at the um, Boston Architectural Center in Wentworth and learning how students and their work and then some projects I have done with students to do out community outreach to learn and listen. So. I work with students to figure out and, and coach them on how to talk to people and how to listen, because listening is a really a key component in that process. This is a rendering of a school where the school had a, this currently is a hallway, which is very dark and not very welcoming. And the school really wanted to be able to say, hey, when we walk in that front door, you will feel welcome. But the other factor they wanted to do is to be able to show off the work of their students. So the two major factors were, were being able to test this design. And we, we did a whole series of renderings and visualizations to hone the design and talk to the school about, does this feel right? Does this feel how it represents your community and the way it will work? And we started off with hand sketches, ended up in computer models. This is pretty close and it is actually under construction right now. Um, affordable housing is something that we're specialized in work on. This is Glenbrook Way, which is a project in Medway, Massachusetts. It's under construction phase one and then phase two. Phase two will be elderly. So we've been working with the neighborhood and the end users to find out how to best integrate sort of a combination of families and elderly within this environment. Interesting enough, it also talks about environmental equity. The half the site is wetlands. There's a brook on the site. And how do we allow people to access that site and be part of both the neighborhood, the environment, and feel like they're part of the town they live in? And that is very important to what we do. So that's our five minutes, our five slides, and it's and nice, and we appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you. Well timed. Thanks, Mike. Um, moving on to Silverman Tarkowski, and I think David Silverman's here. 
There he is. I am, and I definitely broke the five slide rule, but I guarantee being done in five minutes. Okay, good. It'll feel a little bit more like a video. That's great. Okay, um, thanks to, um, thanks Ben, and thanks to the BSA for the opportunity. Um, uh, Silverman Tarkowski Associates is a, um, is actually we're in our 25th year. Um, this is the team. We always kind of float somewhere between 10 and 15 people. Uh, Tom Tchaikovsky and Felice Silverman were the founders. Um, and then I joined the firm in about, about 10 years ago. Felice and I are married. Um, we believe very strongly in uh, social impact, right? Both externally for our community and the people that we design for. But internally, um, we also uh, promote research and kind of collaborate a lot and share knowledge I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end of the presentation. Um, this is some of our work. Um, we uh, basically were right now building a lot of spaces, kind of this kind of incubator space. So this is uh, Greentown Labs in the left-hand corner, which is a, a startup for the clean tech community uh, companies. Uh, on the right hand is Mass Robotics, which is uh, artificial intelligence uh, robots. Um, again, a space for startups. The lower right-hand corner is the Do It Center um, in Roxbury. We do a lot of spaces for children, a lot of community centers. Uh, the middle project here I'm going to talk about in more detail towards the end, which is the record company, which is a music maker space. And then the left-hand corner is um, Urban Project uh, for City of Boston. It's actually a visioning competition um, called Resilient City that we did as a part of a design competition that the Living Future Institute sponsored. Um, so the first case study I'm going to talk about, uh, we did a pro bono project for a um, producer call or, or a makeover show called Bodega Makeover. And this is on Dudley Street, Vega Brothers. Uh, this is an existing condition shot from the, um, the clerk's position, which is hidden behind plastic. And you can see just nothing but food and uh, clutter. And uh, they wanted really, the, the really interesting thing and why STA was involved in or interested in becoming a part of this was that this was really about the food desert problem that cities have and um, just providing healthier ops and options for uh, families and children in neighborhoods. And so we engaged with the community uh, in uh, they had a um, day outside where we kind of collected ideas from the community. I love this one here, like be, be bold and don't sell cigarettes like CVS. <laughs> um, you know, there's all kinds of interesting ideas and feedback that we got to help participate with the design process. Um, on the right hand corner is one of the filmings that took place pre COVID. Um, we also continue to do filming after COVID and construction after uh, during COVID. Um, and then on the left-hand corner is a rendering of this, the space that we did for them. We actually did full uh, construction documents for them so they could file for a building permit. And on the right was um, basically that's this corner on the right-hand side of the rendering showing healthier food, uh, healthier, healthy Roxbury in the finished space where they got some nice murals that were made. Um, really fun, exciting um, and, and worthwhile endeavor for our company and, and really great to participate in something like this. Um, next project is for the record company. Uh, their, their mission is really to kind of in the middle here to remove technical and social barriers between music makers and their creative visions. So um, they had uh, space prior to this renovation and th this, this next format here is a little bit more of a case study, kind of our, our design process, how SDA works. Uh, but um, which was really through deep engagement, but their existing space, they had a couple of studios. Um, the new project expands their offerings. Uh, so they have four major recording studios and 15 music rehearsal rooms in their new facility. So first part of the process here is really just trying to understand the program, um, understand the existing space. We have a Faro point cloud scanner, which was really important. Um, the floors in here were all over the place. Um, so we were able to do accurate uh, existing conditions documentation. Um, then it was kind of, we did a number of meetings with uh, music makers, teachers, recording artists, um, re recording technicians. Again, this, this post-it 
um, think you know that you just saw with bodega is very helpful but images on the wall about what people looked what they wanted to see what they wanted to feel like really trying to understand the how the boston music makers and boston music scene takes ownership of the place floor plans during the early design phases um, early on we kind of put pastel to paper right we don't want to make anything feel like it's finished or especially in our in, in the way that we engage with the clients but it got people thinking about what the space feels like three-dimensionally um, things start to become a little bit more real we go we actually have virtual reality here's um, the executive director um, kind of walking through one of the early iterations of the space um for time just just heads up i'm at time mm -hmm. well, i was fast okay and yeah. so uh just more renderings finished boards acoustic details and construction so and then this is kind of the before and after so i will leave it there thanks so much thank you very much um next we have michael chafalo and ash architecture Uh, oh, for some reason, my sheet, uh, oh, hold on here a second. Can you see my logo? Is that what I'm sharing with you guys right now? Yes. Correct. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. So, um, hi there. I'm, uh, I'm Mike Shafalo, and I am an architect with uh, Catch Architecture. And... Uh, I'll start by giving you a brief overview of our history and uh, philosophy uh, of the firm. So we're a young firm. Uh, Catch Architecture was founded in Wellesley in 2019 by Jonathan Cavanaugh and myself. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary design-driven practice uh, with sustainability at the center of our mission. We work closely with clients as well as teams of consultants, contractors, artisans, and other stakeholders. Uh, to produce architecture and urban design solutions that are engaging and enduring uh, while we uh, also meet schedule and budget constraints. Um, Catch Architecture firmly believes that clear communication across project teams is the key to success of every project. And underpinning our philosophy is a commitment to sustainability, uh, resilience, and justice. And as such, we are committed to pursuing projects that offer opportunities to produce a healthier, more equal uh, planet for us all. And for us, human and ecological health are deeply intertwined and you cannot have one without the other. Patch is a small uh, yet nimble practice. Uh, we collaborate with a range of design professionals to expand our capabilities as required by specific projects um, from interiors to urban planning. Our core team for the community design program consists of Catch founders, Jonathan and myself, and we would act as primary contacts on projects and lead architectural design efforts. Uh, Sarah Kennedy is a collaborator that we've known for years and she brings uh, extensive experience with interior architecture, uh, but also works at the building scale too. And uh, finally, uh, Julia Smachelow. Julia's training and experience in urban uh, design and urban planning bring a strong community focused perspective to our team. And I've also known her and worked with her several times over the years on urban research projects and academic publications. Um, and just to note, uh, Julia and Sarah are not employees of Catch, but rather collaborators that are interested in the um, mission of the, um, of the program. All four of us have, have extensive experience in our fields, but as uh, founders of Catch, I wanted to provide a sketch of uh, sample projects that Jonathan and I have worked on both uh, before starting our office and since. And since we are a new office, these are all, I should note, projects that I'm gonna show that we have worked on with other people, um, other firms, and they're noted um, to give credit um, to the firms that uh, as, as, as uh, necessary. So working with firms uh, earlier in our career, we have uh, experience across a wide range of project types, including Jonathan's work on uh, restaurants and custom single family residential projects. Um, and my work on small mixed use and community centers, 
to larger speculative office, educational buildings, master plans, feasibility studies, and also uh, design reports. Uh, in short, although Catch is new, we have been involved with a range of clients, stakeholders, and project complexities uh, throughout our careers. And uh, to give uh, examples of experience uh, from our experiences that might be more relevant to this program, I want to highlight quickly three uh, project examples. So the first one is while with Fennec McCready Architecture in Boston, I was working with, uh, I, I worked during the design and documentation phase on uh, extensive renovations for the Salvation Army at their Camp Connery facilities in Connecticut. Our work on this project was to renovate a dozen or so camper and staff cabins that were originally built in the 1970s. And these uh, cabins had seen significant wear, uh, primarily to water coming off a roof um, that was not correct, uh, correctly directed away from the building. Um, our work included framing upgrades, uh, new sheathing and roofing, new windows, siding and trim, and accessibility upgrades to two of the camper cabins. In addition to the cabins, we also produce schematic design options for updates to the uh, camp dining hall and the kitchen. Uh, Crossroads Rhode Island is a um, leading homeless service organization and had recently completed a housing community in North Kingston, Rhode Island. And uh, to build on that uh, community aspect of that development, Sarah was on a team at Kite Architects in Providence uh, that was commissioned to design a community center on the housing site. And uh, this, uh, this center included a large community room, full uh, cooking, ki uh, cooking kitchen, classrooms, computer spaces, as well as a uh, fitness room and yoga studio. Michael, we're at minutes. Yep, all right, I'm, I'm just about done. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, uh, while working with the firm uh, Urban Design Skills in the UK, Julia was involved in a robust community engagement process uh, and site analysis for re-envisioning the Neilston Town Centre in Scotland. So there was a diverse group of stakeholders on this project, including community organizations, public and private sector agencies, and elected representatives, uh, as well as the grassroots activists who were the initial advocates for this new town plan. Uh, as part of this group, uh, Julia worked to create a new vision for the town that was meant to transfer knowledge and build capacity amongst its citizens and to support and enable local communities to um, determine the future of their village. And so that kind of gives a broad overview of who we are, what we do. And, uh, and so thanks for listening. And uh, we hope that we can hope uh, service you, uh, can be of service to you on your future uh, projects. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Yep. Um, our next presentation is a movie. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Su Susie Sanchez from UX Studio is unable to be here today, but I'm going to share her film with you all now. Hi, I'm Susie Sanchez, founder of UX Architecture Studio. For this presentation, we're asked to answer a few questions. Who are you? Where are you from? What is your approach to design collaborations? And in response, this phrase kept popping into my head in between. And I realized it was kind of the answer to all the questions. So I've been in the Boston area for about 20 years, but I grew up on the border in El Paso. The pink line here delineates where the physical border exists between the US and Mexico. But really, if you grew up there, especially in the 80s and 90s when the border was much more porous, you didn't feel like we're from here and they're from over there. You really felt like you were from this in-between place that transcended that physical border, but also didn't belong to either the US or Mexico, or maybe belong to both. It's a fascinating place. It's nuanced, sometimes confusing, it's special. And it's the product of a lot of different influences. And as I've developed as a designer and a human being in general, I've realized how much growing up in this in-between place has really shaped the way I think about everything, but especially design, which I see as the product of many authors. It responds to many different inputs and challenges. It's the result of lots of facts and opinions. It's the confluence of lots of different directions merging into this one thing. And in thinking about UX architecture studios design approach, we think of collaboration in the same way. It's a result of your understanding and our understanding. It's a place in between the two, a place that we both own. 
and it has the potential to be really special. So we establish a genuine working relationship with our clients as true collaborators. Our designs are made better by their input and by the experience that they bring to the table as well. So I have a couple of examples to show you quickly. The first is a project currently out to bid for the city of Boston's Office of Economic Development. We worked closely with a client, a mother and son building owner, to renovate their aging and outdated storefront. Our process is fairly simple and honestly not earth shattering. We listen to what our clients want and then we provide some options for them to react to. In this case, they wanted something clean and modern to help them create a presence in their quickly changing neighborhood. And typically the final solution is a lot from one option and a little bit from the others, a kind of curated in-between design. For the second project, Downtown Art and Outflow Mega Dance Company, we teamed up uh, with the city of New York to design a new home for these two arts organizations in the Lower East Side. The building had had many lives before we got to it. Uh, here's a before and after photo. While the forms and lines of the building's new facade really strive to reflect the progressive mission of the two organizations, the color was a deliberate nod to its famous neighbor to the right, the historical La Mama Theater. The back of the building told a whole different story with its graffiti and patinaed brick facade. We realized that it really didn't need much else to really activate the space beyond human activity and maybe some twinkly lights. Of course, what we're most interested in and focused on is our namesake UX, user experience, and how the space actually gets used. We really see our jobs as bringing our expertise to the table to create spaces that allow the client's expertise to truly thrive. And for us, this is honestly the most exciting part of the whole design process, when we see our spaces being well used by the people who help design them. Thanks for listening, and I hope I have the opportunity to meet you all soon. Excellent. Okay, um, our next is a collective of designers, the Cooperative Network of Architects, and I believe Matt Okazaki is going to present, or Gabe, I'm not sure, but I think they're both here. So it's all yours. Um, great, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think James is going to, we're going to all uh, present. So James, go if you want to share screen. Yeah, give me just one second. Uh, okay, I think I'm, I'm starting off. We're all gonna present individually just throughout the presentation. Um, but my name is Christina Shivers um, and we're a group of designers um, working within architecture, landscape architecture, uh, spatial practice, design research. Um, and we, we've worked across a number of um, kind of different areas of uh, design and uh, we're gonna present a few of them in the next couple slides um, and we're all in the Boston area. Yeah. So our approach to uh, architecture and design is a uh, network cooperative approach. Um, and our inspiration from this model has come from research that we've done with the Architecture Lobby, uh, Labor Organization for Architects. So briefly, a cooperative business structure is one that prioritizes worker and community well-being. Um, in a traditional business structure, you often find a handful of owners, many workers, and a cooperative structure is comprised of equal worker owners that collectively share and work and democratically manage the practice. The community commitment of uh, a cooperative stems from uh, the philosophy of economic self-sustenance. Uh, which promotes local investment to create a resilient and sustainable local community. Um, and then a networked cooperative is a scaled up version of this cooperative model. Um, it's a coalition of sole practitioners, partnerships, and firms that all operate under cooperative principles and then share resources, labor, um, and knowledge to collaborate on larger projects than they would be able to do individually. So that's basically kind of our approach to design. Um, and we're just gonna 
show a few of the clients and organizations of who we work with. So um, we worked with uh, the Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence, or ATASC, on a phase strategy for a renovation project uh, for one of their domestic abuse shelters. And we worked with both the organization and the tenants uh, to improve and optimize their existing building, beginning with the kitchen. It was really kind of an interesting strategy approach of how 11 families might use a single ki kitchen um, uh, all, all at once or separately. Yeah, um, this is an ongoing project, which really just means it's not finished yet. But um, actually, we just got a big grant from the Mass Cultural Council for this. Um, which will really enable us to finish the work, um, which is nice. Um, it's really a historic preservation project at the, at the core. Um, this really neat 1886 wood church was in really bad shape and there was even some emergency repair that needed to happen, structural um, work, a new roof. Um, and we're kind of halfway through the project. Um, but the, the, the amazing thing about this is that um, the scope of services was really broad. Um, it involved community work, visioning, um, legacy planning, which is really interesting, thinking about the kind of the long, longer um, uses of the space. Um, walk party planning, which is always fun um, in a pre-COVID world. Um, and also crucially grant writing. Um, so working with the client and as you'll see, um, a new client um, in order to fund the project. So being involved with all parts of that decision-making. Um, and out of that came a new arts nonprofit called Black History in Action for Cambridge, for Cambridge Port, um, which will really occupy and inherit the space for arts and performance uses um, in perpetuity. So really exciting kind of new dimension for this space. So. Some of our group are also working with Eastie Farm. So this is an urban farm group that operates about six or seven sites in East Boston. Um, and they're trying to address food insecurity and teach people how to grow food. So our role on the project was to work with them to develop one of their sites into a secret garden. Um, this, is, this project is also in progress right now. And we're working on a design for a year round greenhouse that will be powered by geothermal energy. Um, it's a really lovely hidden urban site that's also very challenging because it's kind of nestled between a highway with billboards and hidden behind buildings. Um, and we're providing architectural services, project management, and also landscape design um, with the intent to develop a social space and a teaching space for the organization where local residents can learn about alternative forms of energy and permacultural gardening techniques. Um, and they'll be able to hold com community events for the organization. You, you all are at time if you wanna just give one last. Yeah, so those are just a few of the projects we've been involved with, but you know, our, our experience ranges in scale from the infrastructural to the installation um, and also encompasses a bunch of things that uh, aren't really easy to display visually, like um, community organizing, education, permitting, code analysis, all, all that sorts of fun and sometimes less fun stuff. So yeah, we're looking forward to collaborating with everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay, um, Payette is our next presentation. I think Jessica is going to present. Uh, actually, Sarah from our office is going to present. Great, it's all your work. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Great. All set. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica. As I said, I'm going to be joined by several of my colleagues, uh, Kofi, Park, Marissa, and Sarah, who each bring a wide range of experience and expertise to the table. And we're all very excited for this opportunity to work with the community partners and the BSA. Here, pay our core typologies are large and complex that make singular authorship impossible. <laughs> we rely on a large host of collaborators, both internally and on the broader product team to do the work we do. This leads us to ask as designers how we might leverage shared authorship to more successfully navigate complex constraints and priorities, not just internally to our office, but also to clients, consultants, builders, and to the broader community and partners. The rest of our team is going to show you examples of some of our past pro bono work we've done and some exciting new opportunities we're working on now. Uh, if you want to see some of our other projects, you can always visit payette.com backslash studio backslash pro bonos. And I'm going to pass it along to Marissa, who will show our next pro bono project. Thanks, Jess. 
Payette holds an annual day of service on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, where we dedicate the entire day to planning and designing with the issues posed by community partners. Our staff of volunteer produce drawing sketches, concepts, renderings, and engage in collaborative discussion and work sessions with our community partners. We were fortunate that in 2020 that we were able to have a virtual session where we could see all our community partners and the projects that our, within our firm um, contributed to. And in 2019, when we were able to do this, we were able to have everyone come into the office and we got to just see everything. And it's just a great way to uh, work with the community partners and the ability to support of the communities in which we live and work in. And I'm going to pass it off to Kofi. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, so many of our significant executed pro bono projects have been with uh, Beyond Walls. Um, in 2017, we joined forces with a collection of engaged citizens who rallied around the idea that art could be a potent force for public engagement and civic improvement to revitalize the city of Lynn, Massachusetts. These act activists coalesced as the nonprofit Beyond Walls, began a campaign focused on several key urban interventions in the city of Lynn, dynamic underpass lighting, street art murals, and uh, vintage neon art signs. Uh, this work has been this work has been truly this work has truly energized the, con the community and garnered a collection of awards, including a BSA Honor Award, an AIA Honor Award, and the Ru the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence. Um, so the image that you see on your screen um, is from last week at the Rainbow Bridge uh, Lighting for Pride Month. And if you want to know more about the project, um, it's uh, on our website at payat.com slash project slash beyond walls. The next. So um, the pandemic uh, obviously prompted some new civic action that was required. Uh, so keeping with our mission to activate public spaces and strengthen communities, uh, the Beyond Walls team and Payette um, recognize the need for flexible outdoor spaces where people can safely gather, eat, hang out, and enjoy their communities. Uh, so two new interventions were designed to address this immediate challenge. Uh, they were called WASH and FOLD. So WASH is uh, 35 hand washing stations uh, that were deployed in six different cities as a public amenity. Uh, these Stations were really to support uh, the at-risk populations uh, during the pandemic. The success of this design resulted in the expansion of the initiative to include a sister project that is called FOLD. Uh, FOLD is a laser cut sheet metal barrier, uh, which is helping to attractively define the barrier between outdoor dining and street traffic. Uh, the goal really is to support local economies and better leverage public spaces to enhance uh, the community. So both of these projects uh, were designed by Payette. Uh, the metal was cut by local fabricators and they were assembled and deployed by community volunteers as well as paid vocational school interns. I believe Park is next. I got it, yeah. So we've got several more pro bono exercises happening right now. Uh, two of them that you see on the screen here uh, include a community farm uh, and also the architectural design for um, the farm buildings. And then also we've got a project in Chelsea, which is about to you know, hit the pavement if everything goes well with funding uh, and approvals. So that could be the end of the month even. And on any of these community led projects, I think it's important that we as designers aren't coming to the table with the solutions already in hand. So as I see it, our role is really to provide an injection of energy uh, and expertise at just the right time, really, to catalyze the efforts of the broader community. And uh, you know, what does this look like? It could be renderings, it could be showing up to the right meeting, it could be plans or digital survey tools, fabrication expertise sometimes, or the sharing of professional connections. I think in general, um, you know, from the vantage of an architect, our charge is really to provide design that's inspirational um, without being prescriptive and to approach the design process with, with an openness 
a kind of humility almost that invites many voices to contribute. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark and Payette team. Excellent. <laughs> right on time. Um, and our last but not least presentation today, PCA. And I, I think Dave is here and I'm not sure if Laura or Dave is presenting, but the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> Everybody see that? Yes, not against. Okay. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Dave Snell, um, and I'm here with Laura and Mark uh, from PCA. We are uh, from Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're a little over 70 people, and uh, we work in a lot of different markets. Uh, and our, our core value is to design equitable places for all people. And uh, so how that comes out uh, is uh, through our work. We, we work um, in a lot of mixed-use settings. We have um, architecture, uh, interior design, and planning. And so through that, uh, we really have a chance to uh, create, uh, you know, both large and, sm and small places uh, uh, throughout our work. So working in a lot of multifamily, retail, higher education, our interiors practice has hospitality work, restaurants, um, fitness, uh, you know, hotel, other kind of work like that. So we have a really broad range of experience. And we think that um, as a company is driven by uh, you know, some strong core values about what we believe that um, we can be a really great partner uh, to working with some community organizations. Uh, and uh, we do find ourselves, I think we'll, uh, Laura and Mark will speak to this. Uh, we, we work uh, hand in hand with a lot of uh, uh, community partners throughout uh, all of our work. And so uh, maybe we can we'll go forward and we'll tell you some stories about how we do it. And what we do. Hi. Hi, just very quickly, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Mark Clips, I'm a principal at PCA. Uh, I've been there for about 16 years. Um, and Dave sort of mentioned the wide range of things we do. I do a lot of sort of mixed use retail and um, multifamily housing, both um, affordable and market rate and some higher ed. Um, before PCA, I worked at a place that had landscape architects, architects and graphic designers, civil engineers, interior designers. So um, I think I brought that to PCA too, that we work really well in collaboration with uh, a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, designers. All right, I'll go quickly. I'm Laura Homage, principal at PCA. Um, as it relates to community and collaborative design, early in my career, I went all in and learned a lot as a Peace Corps volunteer in Bolivia. And since, there, si since then, similar to Mark, um, have worked on a lot of projects in and out of Boston area, a lot of affordable housing, multifamily housing, um, and a lot of mixed use with retail on the first floor. And uh, so I, I'm Dave Snell, so I'm a senior associate at PCA, been there about 16 years. I uh, do a lot of the same kind of work that uh, Mark and Laura do, and um, you know, really folk make, uh, taking a focus uh, these days on a lot of looking at our projects and and how to make them uh, equitable for all. And so that has a lot to do with our our next topic, which is uh, placemaking. So placemaking is something that is infused through every project that we do at PCA. It's the lens that, you know through which we see things. And uh, what is that, right? What is, what is place making? It, it's really making um, a place that people feel comfortable, that they feel welcome. Uh, it considers the pedestrian over the car, it considers human scale. Uh, and it's it, creating these places, you know, these are, the, these are the kinds of places where your life happens, where you create memories, where uh, you form positive relationships uh, with locations. And so that's a big part of uh, what matters to us. And, and that takes place at all different scales. So, so right here, you see in the top left, uh, Arsenal Yards in Watertown is one of our projects, which has been ongoing for quite a long time. It is a mixed use uh, project that has uh, multifamily housing, retail, office space, hotel, uh, cinema, restaurants, a uh, new um, lab building that's currently uh, starting as well. So th there's a lot of different things happening here. But for us, 
more important than any of the, and than any of the buildings are the spaces between the buildings and how people really interact. And so this is one of the spaces that uh, we created that um, you know we're looking at creating active edges, lots of places for people to sit, lots of places for people to um, you know get out and spend time. Uh, below it is an image um, you know on a slightly smaller scale. It's just a it's a roof deck on top of a residential building, but again. Creating moments of human scale, uh, considering how people interact with one another is really important to us. And then the top right is, um, so last year, uh, obviously uh, with the pandemic, uh, our friends in the restaurant industry got uh, slammed really hard. And we uh, joined a task force with the BSA to help uh, come up with responses uh, and in including uh, how to get outdoor seating for restaurants who normally wouldn't do something like that. Uh, so these were, we, we developed a, a series of uh, resources, a, a toolkit, kit of parts, things how you can create this on a quick budget. You know, there's a Excel spreadsheets and links to Home Depot for different things and, uh, and a quick navigation on, on any code requirements that people would uh, need. And so it's, a, it's really for us in that moment, we're, we're working with people who uh, they're, in a, they're in a tough spot, uh, their backs against the walls, they just need help. And we... Uh, we're there to try to give guidance, to use our skill sets to uh, to help folks. And you know, one of the uh, one of our uh, young designers actually went so far as to be uh, one of the builders of, of one of these uh, little apartments. So uh, you know, we, we like working at all scales and, and prioritizing place making and, and what we do. Excellent, Dave and PCA. You you're all at time. Oh no. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to give a so quick... You hit like maybe like 30 uh, seconds of this last couple yeah, of Yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, so um, a big a big part of our practice is sustainable and responsible design and kind of a focus on some mission-driven projects. And both these two um, have a distinct mission. Uh, the Golden Meyer project's 100% affordable housing extension onto an existing building. Um, and it has... Uh, you know, it, it mitigated some accessibility issues that were on the existing building as well as um, was a real focus on, you know, creating a home that was continuous. And so we've matched the floor to floor heights of the existing building, which is a significant challenge. And then the Roxbury uh, project in Fountain Hill, this is a, this is an all electric fossil fuel free uh, project where it's for 100% affordable housing. And I think we're all aware of the uh, wealth gap that's attributed to home ownership or, or rather lack of home ownership. And so these are both just uh, really mission driven projects that are both uh, highly sustainable. Uh, Gold is uh, enterprise green wells will be well certified as well. And uh, Fountain Hill is uh, lead gold certifiable and energy star rating with a average of a 45 hers rating. So, um, and it's poised to just really set up the homeowners with all electric building, uh, futuristic, you know, approach to, you know, where where we'll all be in the future, where, where we will all be very soon. Excellent. Thank you, PCA. I just want to make sure we have time in these last two minutes. If any of our community partners here on the call um, have questions, thoughts before we wrap up. I had a, just a quick comment. This is Ray Rumpenauer from Midway Studios. Go, go for it, Ray. Um, I just wanted to thank the BSA and all the firms who are participating in this. I think it's just such an inspiring thing to see all the firms um, working towards this, uh, this purpose. And thanks to the BSA for, for getting us started. You're welcome. Um, there's a question from Lauren Goldberg in Thriving Places about how projects will get matched with design teams. Um, to answer that very quickly, I will follow up with our community partners who have submitted project submissions already and get a sense of what teams you'd like to work with. And ideally, over the next week, we'll be able to do some initial meetings with initial pairings of design teams and project partners. Um, in the interest of time today, I will be following up with an email with all of our contact information for each of our design teams 
and a link to this recording. And I'm amazed that we made it to 1 p.m. I'm proud of all of you architects for, for sticking to five plus or so minutes. Um, thank you all for being here. I know it's one. Um, if folks want to stick around and chat, you're welcome to, but you're also welcome to be talk. So thanks again. This is really fun. I'm looking forward to getting some of this work off the ground.